go ahead and get started. Good morning and welcome everyone. We are recording this webinar, therefore a friendly reminder to please put yourself on mute. Thank you for joining us today for the San Diego Organization of Healthcare Leaders Early Careers Live Panel Webinar. My name is Jennifer Reyes and I am with Family Health Centers of San Diego. I currently serve on the sole board as the chair for the Early Careerist. I'd like to start today off with an overview about Seoul. Next, I will give a brief introduction to our panelists and allow them to share their current roles. And lastly, we will dive into a Q&A portion of this webinar. When we begin that Q&A, please ask those questions in the chat and address those questions to one of the panelists or if it's for the panelists in general. All right, so we'll get started with what is Seoul. Seoul is the local chapter of the American College of Healthcare Executives. Our chapter goal is to enrich your professional development and add value to your ACHE membership by providing abundant networking and volunteer opportunities. There are over 80 chapters nationally. And when you become a member of your local chapter, you create a connection to ACHE and serve as a vital link to healthcare professionals and health administration students. It is a welcoming place where you can connect with other healthcare leaders in a professional, friendly, and supportive environment. You become aware of close to home opportunities for learning and networking. You'll also have access to education programs that qualify you for ACHE credits. We also provide programs and resources for niche communities, including students, early careerists, emerging senior executives, and CEOs. Here is a list of the programs and events we typically offer throughout the year. Due to the current situation, we are shifting and looking at other ways on how we can still provide these programs to you. One of our valuable programs is the Soul Mentoring Program, where they match master's students, early careerists, and professionals in transition with a mentor who has at least five years of experience in any healthcare setting. This shows our 2020 Board of Directors, and as you can see, there are several committees that can be joined. If you are not a current member of ACHE or SOUL, this information is on how you can join and get involved. Once you enroll as an ACHE member, you are automatically placed in a local chapter based on your business address or place of residence. With this, here are ways on how you can stay connected with SOUL. If you have any questions, please contact us at the email below. Lastly, we'd like to give a huge thank you to our sponsors for their continued support, which allows us to bring events such as this one here today. And now with that, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our panelist. First, we have Peter Chu. He currently serves UC San Diego Health as a project manager in quality and patient safety, working across the system to drive organizational performance improvement on publicly reported quality measures, as well as value-based care initiative. Prior to joining UC San Diego Health, Peter had the opportunity to work in patient experience at UCLA Health, Cancer Services at Cleveland Clinic, and chapter leadership for the Institute for Healthcare Improvement focused on quality improvement and interprofessional education. He has been an active member of the American College of Healthcare Executives 
since 2016. First as a member of the Midwest chapter of ACHC and later as a member and secretary of Seoul. He holds a master's degree in health services administration from the University of Michigan, as well as a Lean Six Sigma Black Belt certification. Next, we have Fabian Martinez. He serves as a clinic director at Family Health Centers of San Diego at the Chula Vista location. Prior to his current role, Fabian served the community of Barrio Logan for nearly three years as an associate clinic director, where he oversaw clinic operations in adult medicine, urgent care, optometry, pharmacy, and the laboratory. Fabian also has 10 years of experience in social science and public health research conducted in ER and primary care settings. He holds a master's degree in both social work and public health from San Diego State University. Next we have Christine Ortwine. She currently serves as the manager of population health analytics for Integrated Health Partners, a clinically integrated network of federally qualified health centers. She has spent the last nine years working in the public health research and healthcare technology fields, delivering clinical, financial, and quality analysis for health systems and various county and research entities. Christine currently serves the Seoul Board as the chair for College Bowl. She holds a bachelor's in chemistry from Old Dominion University and her master's in public health with an emphasis in epidemiology from San Diego State University. She is a local volunteer with the San Diego Food Bank and is an advocate of, is of issues around health disparities and social determinants of health. And lastly, we have Lieutenant Commander Jason Wright. He is currently the Associate Director at Naval Medical Center San Diego. Operationally, Lieutenant Commander Wright completed an assignment as Battle Watch Captain and Administration Officer for Medical Task Force, Expeditionary Medical Facility in Kuwait. He also served as Director for Administration at the NATO Roll 3 Multinational Medical Unit in Afghanistan. He earned a Bachelor's of Science degree from Southern Illinois University at Carbondale, a Master of Science degree from Marymount University, and a Juris Master's degree from Florida State University. He was commissioned as a Lieutenant Junior Grade in the Medical Service Corps of the United States Navy in 2007. His personal decorations include the Joint Service Commendation Medal, Navy and Marine Corps Commendation Medal, Joint Service Achievement Medal, and Naval and Marine Corps Achievement Medal. Lieutenant Commander Wright has also earned the Navy's Executive Medicine Ambulatory Care Administration Officer and Managed Care Coordinator Qualification Designators. He is a Fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives and has the honor of receiving the Captain George T. Smith Leadership Award as a testimony to his commitment to leadership development and personal accomplishment. Thank you all so much for joining us today. So now we'll pass it on to Peter who will share more about him. Hi everyone and good morning. Um, in terms of the career path I am representing today, I graduated from college and immediately entered graduate school at the University of Michigan. And before I continue, I would like to recognize that a lot of commencement, graduation, and promotion ceremonies took place yesterday, as well as over the past week and month. And although this is a less than ideal environment to be entering after school, I hope all of the graduates on the webinar today don't let that diminish their accomplishments, um, from completing a rigorous academic program, to leading a student organization, to performing research, or working through school to support themselves. Um, please just um, don't minimize your accomplishments over the past, whether it's two, four years that you've been in school. And so while studying for my Health Services Administration degree at Michigan, I do want to highlight my top three experiences while in school. And so Jennifer, the next click will highlight um, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, so leadership involvement with our chapter in school. 
um, really gave me my first exposure to quality improvement, patient safety, and interprofessional education across the health um, professions. I also completed a summer internship at Cleveland Clinic, adopting a very pervasive patient's first mindset at an entirely physician-led organization. And third, I highly value and will always vouch for my preliminary participation in ACAG, attending Congress in Chicago, as well as participating in local chapter events. Um, and from there, I began my time at UC San Diego Health as an administrative fellow, spending a year rotating throughout the health system's clinical and administrative departments while working on projects across strategy, operations, and quality. For those unfamiliar with fellowships, they're typically a one to two year training program designed for students immediately graduating with an advanced degree in healthcare, mostly MHAs, MBAs, MSNs, but also other degrees who think they would benefit most from a comprehensive overview of a hospital or health system, as well as constant interaction with clinical and administrative leaders of the organization. Although typically not obligatory, organizations and fellows have a vested interest in each other by the end of that one to two years um, to continue um, their relationships after the fellowship concludes. So towards the end of my fellowship, as I felt ready to make additional time commitments, I began to get involved with Seoul, first as a volunteer and then moving into different roles on the board. I find Seoul a great way to stay involved with ACG, meet new people, and stay in touch with others, as well as work on projects and events um, like this webinar, for example, I otherwise would not be able to do in the workplace. And so as I began my project management role after the fellowship, I also learned, um, earned a learn Lean Six Sigma Black Belt certification from UCSD Extension, the skills of which have become increasingly important at UCSD. Um, in my role today, my primary responsibilities include performance improvement on publicly reported quality measures, um, whether in Vizient, which benchmarks us against other academic medical centers in the various domains of quality and safety, as well as by CMS, for example, with their star ratings, as well as their quality payment programs, such as value-based purchasing, readmissions reduction, um, and hospital-acquired condition reduction, as well as the LeapFrog um, watchdog group um, that grades hospitals on quality and safety. A brief overview of UC San Diego Health, um, a little over almost 10,000 caregivers, over 800 licensed beds, um, over 30,000 annual hospital admissions, almost a million outpatient visits and surgeries per year. Um, as well as almost a $2 billion operating budget. Did want to acknowledge it as an academic medical center. So ha also having the tripartite mission, not just of patient care, but then also groundbreaking research as well as inspired teaching. And so in addition to the clinical enterprise, wanted to acknowledge the academic enterprise with the schools of pharmacy and medicine, as well as the new school of public health. And then from there also acknowledging our research budget, which is an annual portfolio of over $1 billion. And from there, wanted to um, highlight the structure of UC San Diego Health beyond the patient care enterprise, also health sciences with that tripartite mission, UC San Diego as a whole, and then moving up and across the state um, with the five medical centers and 18 health professional schools, collectively known as UC Health all within that 10 campus University of California system. So I wanted to acknowledge that, although we think of UC San Diego Health here in the county, um, acknowledging its wider participation across the state. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Peter. Next up, we have Fabian. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Fabian Martinez. Um, for all of those who have kids at home, you understand that it's hard to find a quiet place. So if you see a <laughs> Post Malone bobblehead behind me, it's my daughter's, I swear. Um, but anyways, um, I had a very long, hard road to get to where I'm at, which I'm sure many of you can relate to. Um, so I do like to talk about where I started as far as uh, academics. Um, I started at Maricosta College, Community College in Oceanside, North County, San Diego. Um, I spent about seven years going part-time um, to school taking one class here, a couple classes there. Um, but I had a family um, at the time. I mean, I still have a family, obviously, but um, started a family at the time, and it, it, it got hard. So I spent a little bit longer at the community college level than I had I, hoped for. Nonetheless, my family supported me through it, and um, I finally finished seven years after I started. Um, 
And about three years after I finished, I started Cal State San Bernardino, got a bachelor's degree in health science, and took an exam to become a certified health education specialist, but I actually never used it. Um, I started right after my, um, my time at San Bernardino with a, um, a research project at San Diego State University that kind of related to health science, uh, but I'll talk about that in a bit. But anyways, I also have, a, as Jen mentioned, a, a master's degree in social work and public health from San Diego State University, which I finished in 2017. So just to point out, I was in my late 30s, actually, um, when I graduated. So uh, for those of you out there that can relate to, to the story, um, I encourage you to keep going. Um, it, it's worth it. Just hang in there. Hang in there. Tough times. And if you have good family support like I did and, um, you know, encouragement from mentors and whatnot, um, just keep going. Um, it'll pay off at the end. Um, so my professional development, going back to when I had first started um, community college, I, I became an EMT. I took a, I, my first daughter was born and I decided I needed something short term um, to make some more money and um, get my foot in the medical field because that's what I was interested in. Um, so I took a, it was a two semester course to become an EMT and I got my foot in the door in uh, ER. Um, I was in the ER at Palomar Medical Center and Shortly after that, I wasn't even doing that for a year. Somebody was somebody who had just gotten the grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation came in and um, he got to know me a little bit and he offered me a position doing screening, brief intervention, referral and to treatment, which is known as ESPERT um, for alcohol. And it's essentially a dr alcohol and drug intervention program. Um, so he had gotten the grant and he asked me to be part of it because I'm bilingual. Um, so I started doing that in the ER. Pay was better. Uh, benefits are better. Uh, but it was my time in the ER that really opened my eyes to um, the, I don't know, I would say like the, it, the ER is really the front lines of, of healthcare. Like, um, it's, I find it hard to talk about myself and I don't feel like I would get nervous. I didn't think I would get nervous on video, but I am. But um, I, I saw things, it was a very eye-opening experience to see like what lack of, of healthcare, regular healthcare, lack of healthcare insurance, um, can do to people because people who don't have insurance, uh, people who don't have resources to to see a doctor, to see primary care, or don't know that there are resources out there for them, they end up in the ER week after week, month after month for problems that could be easily um, addressed by primary care. Um, one one experience that I like to talk about is um, a parents brought in an eight-year-old uh, girl who had a fever of 103 when she came in. I was brought in to translate and the Turns out the parents didn't take her to the doctor. They were wrapping her with blankets because she had a fever. And the thought is that if you wrap her in blankets, you know, it's, it's going to help fight the infection. Um, long story short, the, the girl's um, temperature spiked. Uh, her vital organs shut down and she died there in front of me. And the parents and the reaction of the parents and, and that experience really opened my eyes to um, spark my interest in public health. Um, it really, you know, I said there's there's something wrong out there. It's it's there's a bigger picture. You know, it, it's something that I I want to be part of, and I want to help people access care or know where to access care and prevent tragedies tragedies like these from happening. Um, so that was my experience in the ER that really sparked my interest in public health. Um, so with the screening and for intervention experience, I was offered a position from San Diego State University Research Foundation. Um, as a supervisor, because I had experience in ESPERT. Um, mind you, at the time when I started, um, I didn't actually have a bachelor's degree. So I felt very lucky that, you know, I got picked up with experience. Um, but it was shortly after that that I started um, my bachelor's degree in um, at Cal State San Bernardino you know, because I was given the flexibility in, in my schedule uh, to do that. So I was working full time, going full time to school. I, I think I worked like two years straight every weekend. Um, but it's what I had to do. You know, I had support from my wife, from my family um, to get through it, but it was a struggle. And nonetheless, there was light at the end of the tunnel. And I just kept focusing on that light. Um, so with grants, whoever's worked on grants before, I'm sure you can relate that. There's always that uncertainty after the grant. Um, is that, you know, you, you don't know if you're going to be able to get on another grant or if they're going to renew the funding, extend the funding. So I kind of got tired of that. You know, I have a family to support and I, I can't keep, you know, with this uncertainty. So I applied for the the dual 
master's degree program at San Diego State, and I was accepted. It was the only the only graduate school um, that I applied to, and I figured if I get accepted, this is my path. This is the next step I have to take. So I got accepted, and that was the next step I took. Um, so part of my um, my graduate studies for, for my internship, I did an administrative internship at Kaiser Permanente Department of Psychiatry in Vista. Um, I was mostly working with data, with numbers. Uh, my experience in research um, made me really good with um, Excel and working with data and managing data. So that's most of what I did um, with psychiatry is looking at patients do for exams, looking at trends um, and whatnot. So um, next slide, Jen. Um, so my, so when I finished my dual degree, um, there's a crossroads for the dualies. We call ourselves dualies. You either go social work or you're going to go um, healthcare administration. Um, I wanted to go healthcare administration and I applied for a, an associate clinic director internship program through Family Health Centers of San Diego. And that's the, the program that Jen did as well. Um, so it's about three to four months of working with the executive leadership team where they give you projects that have to do with finance, program planning, development, human resources, operations, uh, continuous quality improvement. I got to be a secret shopper for a while. And then also um, projects on what certain federal and state policy um, changes would have on our on clinic operations. So the implications that changes would have, like, for example, the CEO would ask us, um, I want a 15 page paper, <clears throat> a 15 page paper on what it would mean to our clinic if we lost Title 10 funding. Um, and I want it in three days. Uh, so it was, I, I describe it as grad school 2.0. Uh, nonetheless, it was an experience that taught me to, to get things done, focus. I mean, I learned a lot of that in grad school also, but um, working directly, directly with uh, senior vice president, CEO, uh, chief financial officer really gave me some uh, good insight into what they're looking for in, in their leadership, the clinic leadership, and um, how to get things done quickly and efficiently. Um, so after the internship program, it's not a guarantee that you're going to get a job as an associate clinic director. Um, but I was fortunate to have been selected, and I got placed at Barrio Logan. Um, the Logan Heights location is actually the first uh, location for family health centers. And I was fortunate to be part of that um, and carry out the mission there. Like, there's a long history at Logan Heights. Um, if, if you guys have time, look it up. It started, like, way back in 1910, the location that, that the actual clinic is standing at right now. Um, so as an associate clinic director at Family Health Centers at Logan Heights, I oversaw clinic operations in adult medicine. I got to see the development of urgent care, and now we have a radiology suite in there. Um, I oversaw optometry, pharmacy, laboratory, and diabetes management program. So as an associate clinic director, I was more like the day-to-day -day operations, you know, um, checking in with providers, looking at schedules, um, trying to fill schedules, um, dealing with issues, service recovery, um, a lot of different things like process improvement, continuous quality improvement. Um, so a lot of different things that I, I got to work on to improve processes and make things more efficient. Um, I was very fortunate to have been given that position at Logan Heights because it, it kept me on my toes every day. Like there's other clinic locations that are not as busy. Logan Heights is the biggest, busiest one. And as I started there, um, it was told to me, if you can survive Logan, you can survive anywhere. And I, I really believe that. Um, I was very busy at that place. Um, so after the, you know, it was about two and a half, almost three years that I was there, I got offered um, a promotion. So as a clinic director, so obviously I was doing something right. Um, as a clinic director at Chula Vista and Rice Family Health Centers, Rice is a school-based clinic that's about two miles from um, Chula Vista. So as a clinic director, I, I'm ultimately responsible for clinic operations. Um, we have adult medicine, we have a women's clinic, pediatrics, we have care coordination, uh, mental health, physical therapy, case management, podiatry, and we're now doing, we've been doing for the past two months, um, testing for COVID-19. And we're seeing about 30 patients a day um, showing up to, to get tested for coronavirus. Um, in my role as a clinic director, I feel like I, I'm, not so much involved in the day-to-day -day things, more on the bigger picture, the planning, where I want to take the clinic, how we're going to grow the clinic, are we maximizing our space in the clinic, or, um, are, are, if there's an office available, are we using it accordingly? 
Um, we have square footage available. What can we do in that square footage? Is care coordination or, or case management, um, are, are, I mean, are they doing well? Are we filling their schedules? Or maybe I should put a vision clinic in there. Uh, with my experience in optometry, I'm actually planning to put a vision clinic in, um, in Chula Vista. Um, so that's coming. And, and as a clinic director, I, I get to make those decisions. I get to do my research. I have more time to look at the numbers. I have more time to look at the referrals and, and everything to, to justify um, the, you know, the, the new program that I'd like to put in there. So that's my role as a clinic director is ultimately responsible for clinic operations, but it's less of the day-to-day -day operations and more of the bigger pictures, more of the macro scale in the clinic operations. Um, but one thing I do want to add um, just to close out is that I am a firm believer in um, the fact that wherever you end up, you should be closely aligned with the mission. So look at the mission, vision, and values of the organization you're looking to get it, be a part of and ask yourself if that's really who you are. And the mission, vision, and values of health, Family Health Center of San Diego, it, the mission is really to provide healthcare services to, the, to those most in need. Um, and that's exactly what I'm doing and, and exact, exactly what I had envisioned myself doing from my early on days in the ER, whether the story that I told you first, how can I make a difference in this family? Um, who, you know, didn't have access to health care, didn't know where to turn to. Um, how could I have changed that situation that was 17 years ago? And now I look back and say, I'm actually doing what I wanted to do back then. So I'll just end it with that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have Christine. Hey, thank you uh, for having me this morning. Hello to everybody, and I'll just echo um, everybody's thoughts. Congratulations to all you new graduates. Um, it's a different world, a different life, but more power to you for being able to adopt and adapt and, and embrace. Um, and for those of you that had to pivot very quickly if you're not done with school, um, but you're still in school, again, um, more power to you for being able to very quickly pivot and, and continue on face of all these changes. So keep it up. And um, much like Fabian, I think I could probably mirror uh, a lot of his um, experiences. I was not a traditional student by any means. Um, I was from uh, El Paso, Texas, which is a border town in um, Lake Juarez, Mexico. And right as I left high school, I didn't really have a path um, didn't think about going to college at all, uh, and so I joined the military and the Navy, um, and everything changed for me. I was an active duty service member, and then I met, you know, uh, of course I met a sailor, um, and my life took another turn, and so it wasn't until uh, I already had a family, I had a child, that I decided that I needed to go back to school to find the things that I wanted to do, and my original career path was around the hard sciences. I was a chemist. I finished my undergraduate and did about two and a half years of master's work, thinking I was going to change the world by, um, can you guys hear me? Sorry. Um, thinking I was going to change the world by developing drugs, but uh, then I realized that's not really what I wanted to do. Um, and so uh, after practicing several years um, as a chemist and then also teaching, uh, we had lots of different transfers. My husband was active duty. I was raising my daughter and I was teaching uh, chemistry and mathematics and loving the interaction with people. And I realized it was around helping people. That's the part of things that I really like to do. And so I shifted my career when I, when we got back to the United States after spending several years abroad, um, I found San Diego State University. And that's where epidemiology and public health and the ability to not only maintain some of the scientific rigor that I had learned in my first degree, um, but also put a, together the piece around using that sort of rigor to be able to provide communities, particularly communities that didn't have equal access or um, equal opportunity to access services. That, um, that's really where I found my niche. And so I uh, you know, finished my degree in epi, uh, MPH with a concentration in epi. And during that time, I was able to uh, work across several research institutions. I worked for the Institute of Public Health, um, where we did a lot of program evaluation, 
And I really found my niche in the numbers. I, that's where I really found that it was the data, that there was a lot of opportunity to work with people. You know, at first you think you're going to do one thing, kind of like Fabian said, I thought I was going to be shoe leather epi. I thought I was going to go out there and do case tracing, which is very interesting considering where we are now. Um, but I realized quickly that even if you think that's the path that you're going to have, that's not necessarily where you hit your stride and it's not necessarily where you find your passion. Um, and it was around the data, the ability to translate data into action and the ability to harness systems to allow everybody to be able to access that data. That's where I really found my niche. And so I spent several years working for the county, did a few internships, um, did a few contract positions with the county behavioral health uh, and also with the Institute for Public Health around program evaluation. Um, and then I went to the acute side. I worked at Scripps for five, fish, five and a half years. Uh, started there as a clinical analyst, grew um, into a role around value-based care as our ability to, you know, we shifted with the uh, Affordable Care Act. We started talking about value-based care. There was really a need to be able to understand how much does it cost? How much does it, uh, you know, in terms of effort, how much does it take to truly care for patients? Um, and so I, uh, we started up a data science team there and I transitioned to population health analytics there um, and spent about five years working with their health plan, with their ambulatory care units, and then with their hospital to try and understand the patterns, you know, people, how are they accessing care, where are they accessing care, and, and how can you put the patients at the center of all of that activity that's going on, particularly when it's very confusing and you're stressed out because you're not healthy or a family member is having an acute event or isn't healthy. Um, so from there, however, much like Fabian, um, I realized, you know, when you work on the acute care, you're getting a, a slice of what happens to a patient. And really the work, a lot of the meaningful work that happens and really our mindset in healthcare today needs to shift to how can we prevent disease as opposed to caring for disease once we're sick. And so that's when I joined up with Integrated Health Partners of Southern California. And if you want to flip the slide, um, Jennifer. Uh, I started here almost two years ago. I've been here for about a year and a half. And Integrated Health Partners is part of a larger organization, a family of companies called Health Center Partners. Health Center Partners uh, used to be known as um, Council of Community Clinics. They've been around for 40 years. They're a large consortium of federally qualified health centers in Southern California in three counties, Imperial, Riverside, and San Diego County. Um, and essentially, they serve a purpose of uh, being mainly advocates, right? So federally qualified health centers are caring for the most needy, right? Usually underinsured or uninsured individuals. They serve in community health centers where people can actually access care. They deliver a variety of services from mental health all the way to um, dental chiropractic services. So Health Center Partners, which is the parent company, they really are the advocacy arm, lobbying both in Washington and at the state level to ensure that our health centers have the funding that they need, um, the services that they need, and that policies support those health centers. Um, in addition, for all of those um, participants, there are uh, 17, 16 now participants in health center partners, they provide a myriad of training, um, uh, opportunities, and additional services such as contracting. Um, uh, over the last year, which has been very relevant, they provide emergency management service support, peer groups, so that people at smaller health centers have the ability to talk amongst their peers and, and talk about, you know, what they're doing at their particular health centers. So they are the parent company. You can see the, the stats on the side. Um, one other branch of Health Center Partners is called Health Quality Partners. Um, and they really are around program evaluation and administration of grants at each of those health centers that are participating. So they offer services around PCMH for federally qualified health centers, different, um, you know, enrollment in uh, Cal covered California and evaluating which members have that. They also various mental health uh, programs that are being administered, including expert actually at many of the health centers. So they provide um, lots of services around that program evaluation and administration of grant monies. They also um, find grant monies for those health centers and for our overall network. And so we are um, an HCCN, a health care controlled network. Um, they got that money and then they help each of the health centers maximize on that particular grant. Um, the for-profit arm of this not-for-profit organization is called Connect. And essentially they're a group purchasing um, organization.
organization. So they allow all of the health centers that are participating to be able to get supplies and whatever it is that they need to run their health centers, they leverage the power of that particular, you know, the power of numbers. And so they support all of our health centers as well. They have a national portfolio. Essentially what we like to say is you can, anything you need to buy to build a hospital, you can buy through Connect and you can leverage their services that way. And just like Fabian talked about, um, and I think the largest learning for me as I left Scripps, who was a great organization and I learned a lot there, um, was that you have to identify with the mission um, and the vision of the organization that you're looking for and the people that you're serving. Um, and so I truly am aligned with the mission of Health Center Partners and with my actual company, which I'm gonna talk about now. Um, I truly am honored to be able to serve uh, these community health centers in a way that they, they need to be. Um, however it is that they need to be supported. So if you can go to the next slide. Uh, the fourth company, which is the company I work for, is Integrated Health Partners, and they're actually a subset of those 16 um, FQs that have decided to be what's called a clinically integrated network. Um, and so you can leverage, among other things, um, what we're looking to do with that clinically integrated network is to provide some shared standards around performance, being able to improve overall cost of care, our financial metrics, being able to leverage as a group the ability to have direct contracting with many of the payers here in Southern California that provide Medicare and Medi-Cal services. Uh, and then uh, one of the large arms and the, Laura, the, the arm that I was brought in to support is the technology side. And so my role is really around the shared technology across these 10 member health centers that have about 85 practices. So they each have their own EHRs, they each have their own clinics or their own organization. But we need to figure out in terms of our population health um, technology strategy, how do we want to share data? Um, how can we use that data to get a full view of patients as they traverse through the entirety of the health system, right? Not just at my clinic, but if they go to a different health center clinic or if they visit the ED from a hospital, how are we able to leverage the data to be able to see a complete picture of what's happening to a patient? Because it can be very confusing and you can have times when that service was delivered at another organization. Now you're bothering a patient. The patient becomes fragmented and the care should really be longitudinal. Um, and so my role as I came on was around trying to integrate that technology strategy and trying to use healthcare technology to empower the clinicians at each of these independent um, organizations so that they can deliver better care for their patients. Also trying to empower the patients and so that we have a better look at their data and their movement through the health system um, so that they're not, you know, the, the care comes to them, what's best for them. Um, and so among other things, we've integrated a population health tool over the last year and a half, uh, which uh, delivers that normalized data, our ability to be able to produce unified metrics, improve our performance around some of direct contact with our payers, and so we're able to increase the revenue for some of these health centers, as well as um, at the, the uh, central level. Governance around the data, so our ability to be able to leverage that data, have one definition around the metrics, so everybody, you know, it's going to be an apples to apples comparison, which is really difficult to do, but incredibly important if you want to really talk about improvement of care. Um, privacy and compliance, if we're sharing data across organizations, how do we make sure that it's Secure? How do we make sure that health centers are, um, individuals are seeing data that need to see data? Um, and lastly, around improving their analytical strategy. So that's really my key role. How can I deliver the data in a way that's meaningful and timely so that each of the health centers has an understanding of how they're performing and where they might need to shift, uh, particularly if they want to pivot toward risk based care? And so we all know uh, about value based care, that's really where it's at, right? But we need to be able to make sure that we have a clear understanding of how much it actually costs to care for these patients and, and where it is that we can make improvements. And data is really the linchpin around that. So I'm super happy to work with lots of different health centers, lots of different people. It's a dynamic role and it's actually that perfect spot between getting into the weeds and using and leveraging technology, big data platforms like Hadoop and R, been able to really flex my skills there. Um, and then also working with people right, to help them translate the IT vendors versus the tech, the clinicians, and anybody that needs that sort of connection, I have the capacity to be able to do that. So it, it really is the perfect mix and not one that I ever thought I would find myself in. And so again, you don't know where you're going to end up. Um, 
think about it because don't ever turn down that opportunity. You never know where it might be. Thank you, Christine. Next, we'll move on to Lieutenant Commander Wright. Hi, and good morning. Um, really appreciate the invitation here today uh, to be a part of this panel. And um, I tell you, I could just sit here and, and, and watch this uh, like, like everyone else who tuned in. I mean, these have just been fantastic stories and this experience has been shared. It's just been uh, motivating, truly motivating. So I started in Navy healthcare, um, actually out of high school. So um, I spent about the first 14 years uh, working as a hospital foreman and um, specifically as a medical photographer. Um, loved it. It was, you know, great times, but uh, the time came though to, the Navy has this way where you really need to uh, continue to promote. Um, it's either promote or you're out of the organization. So I was looking for other ways that I could uh, best serve, best serve uh, in the Navy and continue to be successful. Um, what I came to was in, um, was to get a, or to earn a degree, pursue a degree in healthcare management. At the time, I wasn't sure exactly where that was going to take me. I just knew that this was the thing to do. You know, I, need, I needed to pursue that education since I didn't you know, do that right out of high school. And it was at uh, Southern Illinois University. I was attending school on the weekends where I, um, it really largely because it was geographically located. I, you know, I was there. It was, it was accessible, the degree, and it was aligned with healthcare. Um, but it was there where I really uh, found my passion for for healthcare management. If you go to the next slide, please. So um, in healthcare management, well, upon finishing that degree, um, the only way to earn a commission as a, as a healthcare administrator in the Navy was actually to have a master's degree. So I uh, continued uh, my, my studies in, uh, while I was enlisted and, um, and went to Marymount University and, and then earned my commission. Um, it was about 14 years, you know, after I started in the Navy. So like Fabian, um, came at this a little bit later as far as the, um, the leadership roles. But um, this is what I truly loved about um, healthcare administration in the Navy. Um, upon my commission, when, you, when we, when we uh, commissioned somebody to do this work in the Navy, uh, you're expected... Um, really right out of, right off the bat to assume a leadership role. Uh, my first duty station, I was stationed at a hospital in Beaufort, South Carolina, and um, I was uh, put in charge of the human resource department there. And uh, as, a, you know, as a department head for both um, military manpower and also civilian human resources. And um, really just fantastic opportunity uh, to serve. And that's actually when I uh, had my first deployment. So I'd made it all this time, you know, 14 years enlisted and, and hadn't deployed. Uh, but there as a, as a naval officer, I was uh, deployed to, uh, to uh, Kuwait uh, to serve at a, um, at a small hospital that we had there. And, um, but once again, I found myself in administration, um, kind of working on the admin side, uh, ensuring that everyone's personnel records were up to date and all and um, working in the hospital, but um, it was more of my peers. We had you know, the physicians, nurses, and the healthcare administrators who were working like, in patient administration or IT that were doing more of the, um, those direct healthcare uh, functions. Um, as Battle Watch Captain, though, I was responsible and uh, maintained comms for uh, a lot of the um, injuries and patient movements around in the field and monitoring kind of where our units were um, that were off the base. Uh, so it was definitely very rewarding. And um, also just one of the greatest things that I, um, everyone has to find their passion and really being involved in, in healthcare um, and providing that, I guess, um, supporting or enabling the healthcare delivery to our service members, whether we're deployed or um, here at home, um, making those things happen, you know, making healthcare happen is really what I love about uh, the medical service Corps. What I love about uh, being a healthcare administrator, um, it's, for our, it's for our active duty service members, for their 
uh, for their families and for the retirees. It's just fantastic. So um, finishing up at, um, at Buford, I had a, um, a small um, period of time with, where I um, transferred to a duty station in Millington in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, to work with Navy Recruiting Command and just kind of help with some recruiters um, across the nation um, find um, you know, positions and nurses to join our service. So it was much different than what I had been doing at the hospital, uh, but it was a rewarding career, uh, a rewarding duty station all the same. Um, but I definitely was eager to get back into healthcare. And so from there, you know, direct healthcare. So from there, I took orders and went to um, Naval Hospital Pensacola. So at, at Naval Hospital Pensacola, um, I started off as a department head in operations management. Now for, for Navy healthcare, um, when you work in operations management, it's, it's kind of a, a, it can be a mixed bag. And in, in Pensacola, what I was responsible for was um, housekeeping, I was in, uh, responsible for environmental services, the uh, you know, medical waste disposal, uh, responsible for mail and transportation, um, uh, linen, laundry service, things like that. Um, you know, the interesting thing is, is that uh, you, you find, and I have found since um, my, all my time in the Navy, that every new duty station, and we typically transfer every two to four years to a, a new duty station, um, it's, it's a different job. And, um, you, you know, you, you, you show up, or maybe before, of course, maybe before you get there, you have some idea of what it is that you'll be doing. But, um, but yeah, you, 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 you arrive at that new duty station and there's just something now different that you have to do, things that you have to learn and, um, and really adapt. So, um, so I was working in op, uh, operations management for actually for a couple of years there. And once I was selected for my next promotion, I asked my, uh, I asked my boss, the, uh, the director there, um, we call them the director for administration. Uh, they do more than administration, though. But um, so I asked uh, the DFA if I'd have uh, could have an opportunity to actually work down at the clinic level. So that's really, really like um, why I wanted to be a, a hospital administrator is to work more at that clinic level, to work with access, to work with population health at that level. You know, with our heat metrics and. Um, and, and just really facilitating working with providers and our corpsman and our nurse that we had assigned to the team to you know facilitate care um, to um, meet our needs you know the patients' needs uh, that they had there and so I was given that opportunity and I was able to actually transfer out of my department head job which was a little risky um, over to a job working as a division officer and clinic manager. Um, for family medicine, uh, then I moved over to internal medicine, which was smaller than our family medicine. So we had a family medicine uh, GME program there, so it was a little larger. But to so our internal medicine, but then I picked up behavioral health, and again, just you know, just a great experience there, um, working in that close, you know, working with patient complaints, and it's just, um, you know, it's really it's fantastic. Um, I left there, um, was supposed to go to. Naval Hospital in Oak Harbor, uh, but then received a call from my detailer a couple of months before I was supposed to transfer there, and they offered me to come to San Diego. So I couldn't turn that down. Um, upon arriving, and if, if you would go to the next slide there, upon arriving at Naval Medical Center San Diego, I applied and was selected for um, a job as the Associate Director for Healthcare Business. So again, uh, so that other experience I had at, at Pensacola was able to, you know, to, I was able to build on it, uh, and that, which, which was my hope, um, and, and work in healthcare business now. So a little bit of a, of a higher level, um, being out of the clinic now, but kind of understanding how clinics work and access, and now instead work at healthcare business where we were working across all of our primary care and specialty care um, service lines that we have here at uh, Balboa, we like to call it. We're in Balboa Park, I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar. Um, so yeah, this is us here. I won't go over all of these um, details, but um, from, uh, from healthcare business, I, I worked there for about, I guess, uh, about a year and a half or so. Um, and that's uh, encompassed from everything from our um, case managers, all of our case managers for the hospital work from there, to our patient relations, and then um, our 
referrals. We, we, we work directly with the managed care support contractor. So um, the, we have care that we provide here. And it's our direct care services that we provide. Um, and then we have care that's provided you know, in the network. And so we work through our managed care support contractor to ensure that we that, that they maintain access for our patients that um, that we send to the network um, or who choose to receive their care in the network. Um, and then also we were working with all of our internal you know, clinics, all of our um, medical directors here to ensure that um, you know the same that we have that we have access that our per member per month is um, is is not too high, right? And that we're um, doing things as efficiently as we can and that our patients have access. So one of the things that may, I guess is different about military medicine in general is, you know, we're, well, we're, we're funded, right? So our taxpayer money, you know, pays for the, um, for the services that we provide here. And um, so the, the business analysis isn't always the same. And you saw a lot of great um, information just today in this presentation about that. So things are a little bit different here and um, oftentimes we're a little bit more expensive. And actually our leaders in DC have realized that as well, that we're a little bit more expensive than elsewhere. And so we're trying to become more efficient. But the reason it's important is because of those times we do have to deploy, we need our providers, um, our active duty providers, because we're sending them out into harm's way to care for our service members. And um, well, they have to maintain their competency. So we're taking a, a, a decided shift um, in how we do business and focusing on um, readiness. Um, but at the same time, we've stood up an organization that's gonna focus on that healthcare delivery. So rather than trying to do both things where we're trying to maintain and ensure that our physicians, nurses, and hospital foremen are, um, are competent and that they are ready to provide world-class patient care in the battlefield, um, in it, we've s now can focus on that mission while we have our defense health agency, which has stood up, which will focus on the efficient delivery of healthcare services, both through our direct care and through our purchase care markets. On that note, I'll pause here to also um, state that what I'm kind of sharing with you here is like the active duty side. Um, but here in this hospital and every hospital I've been to, we have um, many, many um, civilian employees, they're government civil service employees, as well as contractors. So um, there's absolutely many opportunities, even if you choose that, if you, know, if you weren't to be in the service like I am, if you're pursuing um, you know, healthcare management and leadership opportunities on the civilian side, there are opportunities still with uh, Navy Medicine or Defense Health Agency and to work in these same facilities um, in uh, delivering um, and making uh, healthcare available. So um, working in healthcare business, I um, was accepted, I applied for and was accepted uh, for an opportunity to be a director for administration at the NATO Role 3 in Kandahar, Afghanistan. Um, as a director for administration, you're, they like to say that, because it stands for, you know, it, the acronym is DFA, they like to say that you're the director for anything. Pretty much if it's non-clinical, um, it's either gonna be in our comptroller with our resource management, but if it's not that, then it's, it's the DFA. So um, what we're responsible for as a DFA is the um, you know, building management, the IT, um, patient records, um, we're responsible for human resources, uh, emergency management, um, and uh, materials management, supply, uh, these things. Um, so, did that there and was out and uh, deployed in Kandahar for about seven months, six months. And um, wow, what a, what a great team. You know, um, it just, you know, just continues to ignite your passion when you are able to see, you know, your, um, your colleagues, your, the, the physicians and nurses and the care that they provide. So even though I'm the, the, the director for administration, that can't be the only thing that I do and out there, I worked um, whenever we had a mass cow, uh, a mass uh, casualty uh, come in. Uh, um, my job, I would go out uh, when they unloaded patients from the ambulance and I'm clearing the patient. What does that mean? But ensure that they didn't have any live ordinance on them, make sure that they were um, safe. So I, um, in that, and in doing that, 
really got to see some some of these patients who came in and um, with their battlefield injuries and that it it really it really touches you. It's it's really something. So couldn't be um, more more proud to do the job that I do. When I returned though, um, I was selected for another associate director position. And that's where I am now as associate director for administration. So just like in Kandahar, much bigger role here though, um, still have these same functions underneath me. Plus we have nutrition management, which actually falls under us. So I'm um, doing um, basically everything that's non-clinical um, falls underneath the director for administration and, um, you know, in supporting facilitating um, the delivery of healthcare. And yeah, that's kind of it. But Based on, I know we want to leave some time for questions. Thank you so much, Lieutenant. Um, I will go ahead and start reading a few questions from the chat. Um, I know we might go over time, so I, um, since you are sending me your questions, we can share the contact information of our panelists today, and then that way, if they're specific to one of the panelists, we can share those questions with them and they can answer you. Um, one of the first questions that was shared is, there are so many great healthcare master's programs out there. What do the panelists recommend considering in terms of curriculum to narrow down the selection? Um, if I may, what, um, so I've pursued two degrees. Uh, my initial master's was at the beginning as, as I shared and what I was looking for was a, was a degree program that was um, CAMI accredited. Now I was pursuing that MHA. Uh, some people, if you go the MPH with healthcare management uh, focus or MBA, um, those are all great as well. But for me, I was looking for an MHA program and then uh, look for kind of who that standard was, which was CAMI. MBA, you would look for that uh, AACSB and you for an MPH, the CPH um, accreditation, so. Thank you. The next question is for Fabian. It says, I just completed my MPH and my thesis was on burials to physical activity in the Latinx community. Low levels of activity have been linked to common and preventable diseases such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, and liver disease. On a national level, physical inactivity costs the US economy millions of dollars. In San Diego, we have had programs that start off extremely well and lose steam along the way. It is challenging. How does Family Health Centers promote physical activity and maintain the engagement? Good question. Um, to start off, I think Family Health Centers, um, for, Family Health Centers has 26 locations throughout San Diego. And I think one of the things that we do very well is understanding the community that we're serving. Um, so in, in reference to the, to the question about that, that next community, um, Family Health Centers has a very robust um, health education nutrition program. And through that program, there's actually uh, physical activity classes, uh, there's Zumba classes um, that are actually very well attended by the community. Um, when I was at Logan Heights, my office was right above the multi-purpose room. And Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays, there was Zumba classes and I could hear the bass booming, boom, boom. <laughs> um, and, and the people shouting and having a great time. Um, and that, was, that went on the full, almost three years that I was there. And now that I'm at Chula Vista, we have Zumba twice a week. I don't get to hear the music and kind of move my arms to music, but um, um, Zumba is one of the things that the Latinx community responds to very well because um, it's, it's music that they like um, with people that they can relate to and they have their own Facebook page. Um, so it's, I say it's a very good, great success. Um, they also have a pediatric development um, services department that does group exercise classes for children. Um, that's, it was once a week at the Logan Heights community, at the Logan Heights location. And that's um, very well attended too. There were at least 10, 12 participants um, and the kids would get engaged because they had really good um, uh, coordinators and, and trainers and, and that would, that would conduct the group exercise classes. So I think getting to know the community, what they respond to best and, and meeting them where they're at with the music that they like, with people that they can relate to and, and conversate with. I think that's, that's part of keeping people engaged. Thank you. This next question is for Peter. 
It says, what challenges did you face transitioning from a student into your first full-time position and what made you successful? I would say school is probably where you pick up most of the theory part of practice. And so I think moving into a full-time role in the workforce there's a lot that hits you just in terms of how you interact with people, not only within your own department, but then people across other departments. I think that's a part of maturing that doesn't come as easily in school. I think helping to lead student organizations definitely is a step in the right direction when adopting those sorts of practices, but realize that a lot of the stuff you learn in the classroom um, will help you from a technical perspective um, in the workplace, but really, interacting with people, building those relationships are probably going to be some of the most challenging things when you're entering the workforce. Great, thank you. And this next question is for Christine. What skills or certifications do you find most useful in your current role? Uh, I would definitely say the skill set that you need would really be attention to detail and uh, a an sense of, of curiosity. So the ability to quickly adapt um, and follow your train of, of curious nature. And so you're essentially, particularly when you're talking about healthcare informatics um, and healthcare IT spaces, you really have to be the kind of person that um, follows, while you're following obviously a set of rules, you have to think outside of the box um, because oftentimes the problem doesn't have a very straightforward solution. So that, that's definitely the skill set that I draw upon the most is really around how can we not say no, right? You have to be able to solve the problem, even if the solution does not seem to be straightforward or everyone around you is saying, yeah, that can't happen. It's not going to happen. You're not going to do it. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing in terms of technical skills, definitely have an understanding at minimum of, of uh, responsible um, and rigorous data analysis. So you need to make sure that if you're wanting to work in that space that you have a clear understanding of the right ways and the wrong ways to analyze data because that can get you in a lot of trouble. Um, and then in you know, basic skills of the ability to produce uh, clear charts, well-labeled, well-sourced, well-referenced because that's what your leadership is going to be using. It's particularly C-suite leadership, if you're driving your business, you need to make sure you have a clear understanding of those metrics and your ability to be able to produce those types of analytics. And then lastly, the number one skill that I've learned over time is the ability to translate IT into business speak and the ability to translate business speak into IT, because those two functions have to work together, but they never speak the same language. So <laughs> it's hard for sure. Thank you, Christine. And lastly, just to end on a good note with everyone, I would like to ask each of the panelists to share what advice would you have for others who want to set off in a similar direction to where you are today? Uh, Whoever wants say, to go first. <laughs> I will say don't let people tell you it can't be done. Um, probably the number one thing that I did when I was at Scripps you know, they, they said, we don't have a need for that role. We don't have a need for that function. Um, and I um, said, really? Because I think you do. And instead of just kind of whining about it and lamenting the fact that that role didn't exist, I put forward a, a clear path and showed my, my leadership at the time where the organization would benefit from having that role. Um, and eventually it made it all the way to the top and they created a complete new set of positions at that very large organization. That position had never existed um, and they created it and it became part of their lexicon. So even if people don't think it deserves the, you know, due course, if you've got that passion in you and you think it needs to be and you have the proof around it, go for it. Like don't let people tell you it's not possible. Oops. Um, I would say be humble, be true, be real. Don't burn bridges, very important. Establish positive, relation, positive relationships, maintain those relationships. Because further down the road, you might encounter people that you encountered in the past. And it's important that you just be yourself. Don't, don't try to be somebody that you're not. Um, I, what I've observed in my experience, you know, even through my time as an EMT, through the ERs and all that, um, 
it's it's just being genuine uh, you know just just keep your eye on your goal be real be yourself i mean that's the best advice that i could give is and people will notice what you can do if you're truly you know talented in what you do and you you really have a good head on your shoulders and and show that you're genuine about what you want to do and genuine about the mission genuine about your passion people will notice that and you will work your way up you also got to put yourself out there in a, in a, in a subtle way, not so, um, uh, uh, yeah, there we go. I'm done. Fabian, that's a great point. Um, it is a, you know, being true to yourself and, and being dependable, uh, taking care of your people and taking care of your boss as well. Um, really important. Um, I'll add to that and say that, um, as, as you, as you're promoted to different positions or you're given new opportunities, uh, remember that what made you awesome, what just made you great, what everybody loved about you in your last position, isn't necessarily gonna be the same toolbox or the same skill set that uh, is gonna be effective in your new job. So if you're, if you're just awesome with, 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 with data analytics and your boss loves it and you grow in the organization and now they wanna give you a position um, where you have somebody like your former self, right, your former position um, answering to you, you have to give them those same opportunities you were provided to be successful or to fail. Uh, so just be cognizant of what your role is and what, um, what your leaders expect of you. Um, ask them that. And, um, and, and when you lead others, uh, just be sure you give them the room that they need to be successful and, um, and, and support them. Um, without micromanaging. I would add if you're a student or a recent graduate or you're just within the first few years of your career, um, don't let the fear of striking out keep you from playing the game. And so the world is your oyster. The answer is always no unless you ask. And so if you see an opportunity, um, you know your, your skill set and your strength, just always go after it because the worst that can happen is that you figure out something else about yourself and use that to move forward. Jennifer, you're muted. Thank you, can you hear me now? <laughs> Thank you all for joining us today and your contribution in today's webinar. This has been very awesome, you know, to hear everyone share their amazing journeys on to how they got to where they are today. Um, I hope that this was insightful and that everyone was able to gain something from today. Um, I really want to thank our panelists, Peter, Fabian, Christine, and Lieutenant Commander Wright. I really appreciate you all taking the time and from the comments in the chat, I know everyone else has too. Um, so thank you again, everyone, and I hope you have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. You're welcome. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, everyone.